All right, everyone can hear me all right? Perfect, good morning. I, I'm very excited to be here. Who else is excited for the first B-Sides Philadelphia? This is awesome. Um, first off, big round of applause for the staff and the organizers. I put together, helped put together four B-Sides up in Rochester, New York, and it is a ton of work. So hands off to these guys for pulling off their first B-Sides. A lot of stuff goes behind the scenes to make this event happen. So it's very cool to see it, one, sell out, and two, see it have fantastic talks scheduled for today and tomorrow. So be sure to come back tomorrow, too, and have some fun. All right, so let's get into this. I am Tom Richards. I am a senior security consultant for what was formerly called Citadel. Uh, we just got acquired by Synopsys, and I'm officially a Synopsys employee starting today. I am our red team domain lead. Uh, I am responsible for overseeing all of our delivery and knowledge management for our red team activities throughout Sigil. So all of our um, red team assessments and knowledge management on the inside, SAO creation, client uh, calls, all that stuff falls under my domain. Uh, that's my Twitter account if you want to follow me. I'm not too chatty, but you know, more the merrier. Uh, like I said, I'm also a volunteer for B-Sides Rock. We did six total. I've been involved with four. Uh, these things grow every year, and it's a great turnout to be here. Uh, I've spoken before at B-Sides San Francisco, Carolina Con, Derby Con, Con, and AppSec DC. All right, who here is responsible or participates in their security program within their organization? Awesome, it's better than the last time I gave this talk. Who here in the responsible parties performs any sort of social engineering, physical pen testing, or true adversarial emulation as part of your security program? That's way more than my last talk, so that is awesome. Hands off to you guys for doing that sort of stuff. We're gonna talk about here incorporating adversary emulation into your testing for your security or for your organization to better your security posture, right? Pen testing uh, sort of has blinders on sometimes. You know, you just test the network or you just test the application. You very rarely test it all at once. And that's where red teaming comes in and makes this very different. So there's a bunch of different definitions for red teaming. Uh, one of them is challenging a group's perceived notions, assumptions, and or processes. So just because you've always done something this way doesn't mean that's the right or best or secure way of doing that. Red teaming also falls into three categories for what it can function in and vulnerability probes, which is essentially what we do in IT security testing. Uh, simulations, and also alternate analysis of any sort of information that may be coming up. A Little bit of the history of red teaming. Uh, the Catholic Church actually had some form of red teaming when it came to a devil's advocate position. Devil's advocate position was put in place to challenge the proof that someone needs to become a saint. In order to become a saint in the Catholic Church, you have to do some sort of, uh, perform a miracle to be granted sainthood. So you could see how everyone's like, oh yeah, I just did this, right? This person should be a saint. Uh, this was instituted in the early Middle Ages to control the influx of saints. Uh, interestingly enough, Pope John Paul II abolished this in the 90s and removed the devil's advocate position, and then we had a huge influx of saints into the Catholic Church. Uh, the military used red teaming quite a bit, looking at game theory, the CIA red cell, uh, always looking at what the opponents might do, or more importantly, what Russia was going to do during the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. Uh, it was primarily focused with the communist threat, and looking at how Russia might react to certain things that the U.S. military will do, as well as the CIA red cell, which is a function within the CIA which challenges uh, a group's assumption of intelligence. 
right? So if you're part of the Russian branch and you're just watching, you know, what the Soviets are going to do, you might come to quite a few conclusions that things might be missiles in different spots when they might not actually be missiles because that's what your job is to do. The CIA red cell would take the same information and look at it with sort of a different perspective and non-bias. So they would either come to the same supporting conclusion or argue against the conclusion that no, those might not be missiles, those might just be like bunkers for something. Uh, the government did quite a bit of red teaming internally as well. Uh, the Federal Aviation Agency actually had a red teaming component that in the early 90s went through and tried to break into airports and see what they could do to damage, to take down planes or cause some sort of mass terror attack. There was a bunch of information that was came out of that to prove that certain threats were possible, but no one took them seriously enough to actually implement the security changes that would be needed to prevent some of those things that they found from happening. Uh, we unfortunately learned about those in 9-11. So after that, you know, they go, well, how come no one told us? Like, well, actually, we did tell you all this stuff was bad, but no one listened. When it comes to information security, IT, uh, we're going to define red teaming like this. We're going to focus on just vulnerability probes, right? But we're going to look at it as not just a bug hunt, which is what most pen testing is just looking for, right? Find all the bugs you can to make sure nothing's bad, fix, update, repair. Uh, we're going to look at goal-oriented assessment, where testers emulate the perceived adversary using any means necessary to achieve the goal. We're not looking at the breadth of the organization, we're looking at depth. We're trying to go after something inside your organization. Your juicy bits, your financial information, your customer information, any of that stuff that's available that you would be concerned about compromising assets is what red teaming would then go after. We've also done risk assessments as part of this as well. And you discuss with the relevant stakeholders, understand technology, and look at the risk. So it's sort of like a whiteboarding exercise. We did this for a bank. Uh, it was very interesting because when I was told about the assessment, I kind of took back and said, really? They were literally moving millions of dollars by email. Someone would email them and then they would go, okay, we will move these millions of dollars from one account to another. They were like the middleman between an investment firm and like a hedge fund manager, the hedge fund manager and the client. So the bank would never actually meet their client face to face. The person giving them the money, they would never meet face to face or have very little interaction with. It would be the hedge fund manager basically sending in this information through email about their bank information, their routing, and, and how much money to move when and where. Through email, uh, there was very little checks and balances involved in this process, and it was kind of unnerving when I discovered this going through that you could just send in an email. Uh, so the risk assessments, the different processes and technologies can be done as well uh, from a red teaming perspective. I mentioned this earlier. Organizations we've been finding will have a security program, right? You will pen test your network. You will pen test your applications. You might do some social engineering, which is awesome that so many people raise their hand for that. But do you do it all at once? Do you do it as a full assessment? Gaps in your security posture can exist where technology domains overlap. So you test your network, which is great. You test your applications, which is great. You test your people, which is fantastic. But do you test them all at the same time? What controls do you have in place for where your network and your applications overlap? Right? Is that server really supposed to talk to that other server? And are your people following the process and procedures that you've put in place? You want to test the security posture of the entire organization through this usually trying to emulate some sort of adversary with a goal in mind, right? What am I going to go after as an adversary for the organization? This is a great example of when I said this is not a bug hunt, right? So we were on an assessment, a red team assessment, and the organization had a very small footprint. 
very small footprint. We did come across an SFTP server that they had running, which allowed them to transfer information for clients. So, right, so clients would send them information securely because it was SFTP, right? So they used the name password, it was secure. Uh, and then that's how they got that information out. Now, when we were looking at this in a normal network vulnerability assessment, you would say, okay, there's an SFTP server listening here, great. Is it up to date from what we can tell? Is there anything crazy about it? No, okay, mark it down, move on. There might not be anything interesting. Well, since this was a red team, we were trying to break into the organization. We actually had a very limited success in the phishing campaign. They didn't really do too many creds. Some organizations like to run their own phishing campaign when we run a phishing campaign, so they catch like their people first, so people are more like on alert about what's going to happen. But what we found is this SFTP server did have SSH enabled. So you could authenticate. We did have one working set of credentials that we got from our phishing campaign, and we were able to connect to the SSH server. Now the interesting thing is, they had the SSH server set to disconnect anyone on SSH within about five to six seconds. So you would log in, have the shell, and then it would kick you out. But you would have enough time to launch one command. So we loaded up Cobalt Strike, it was a Windows box, which was fantastic, dumped the PowerShell payload to download Beacon in that five seconds, and we had access to that box. That service was running as a, a, a local admin. From there, we took over their entire network, just because they had SSH listening and not fully disabled on that box. That's the difference between a red team and a network vulnerability assessment, right? We were going after, we found a way in, and we got in through that misconfigured SSH server. Businesses have threats. Every business has a threat. And they're both internal or external. There could be competitors, nation states, rogue actors, criminal organizations, botnets. How about the IoT taking down you know, whatever it wants because you just have all these routers out there with default passwords. Or even the ransomware. That's becoming pretty prevalent, right? Sometimes people pay. Then it just the Muni system in San Francisco was given free rides because their systems were taken over by this. You know, these are real threats going after. Hospitals are actually paying the ransom to get their systems back because they don't have proper uh, backup procedures and things in place to prevent this from happening. We've actually had a couple clients approach us to try and emulate some sort of ransomware attack on their network to see what would happen. Would their users click? Would they go through? What would happen when they got the alert? So these things are real and are happening out there. And we want to try to emulate those as best you can going through. You want to focus on their techniques. What would they do? What would those phishing emails look like? Would they walk into the office? Not too many people would walk into the office to break. It's much easier to do it remotely, but it is there. What tools would they have? Do they focus on mostly probably open source tools, right? The criminal organization might not buy the license for something. They're going to want to steal it. So we want to look at what would they have available in their portfolio. Their skill level. Are we talking about just script kiddies? Or are we talking about people making grammatically correct and very visually uh, authenticating a website or an email that looks like it's part of the organization to go through? Right? The number one thing to fail on a phishing email is to spell something wrong or have very poor grammar, because that stands out, that you're not supposed to be reading it or that something's wrong. Also, targets. Are you going to go after the entire organization? Or are you just going to go after the executives? The executives have all sorts of juicy bits, and they usually have the least security, too, which is pretty funny. You know, I want my password to be ABC. Change the policy for me. I'm the CEO. That happens. That happens. When you look to bring this into your organization to get your security posture going, start doing these red team assessments. You're going to have to know quite a bit about yourself. You need to be able to identify the things that people are going to want to go after, right? What are your assets, your informational assets, right? Your IP, 
your customer information. Where do those live? What is it? What sorts of information do you collect on your customers, your clients, your people, your employees, right? HR has everyone's social security number on it. I was on a red team engagement. We got into the office after hours. We went snooping around and we found one of the secretaries. Well, one of the secretaries was responsible for also creating all the employee credit cards. So all the company credit cards that were given out to employees were handled by this one secretary, which was great because her uh, filing cabinet was unlocked and everything was just in paper there. So I had stacks of paper of everyone's credit card application, which was everything. Social security number, address, you know, anything to open up a credit card was there. Your technical assets, where are your computers? This just happened last week. We actually were doing a war dial-in assessment. Yes, modems. Who here remembers modems? Companies still have modems. They still have uh, out-of-band technical remote access so that in case everything goes down, they can still get in. It took our IT department a while to bring in the analog lines and find the modems and get the technology we needed to be able to do this, but once we did it, we kicked it off. And we started doing the manual assessment of the modems that called back. Well, that we had that answered. That was an actual modem. We got to this one, and there was no login prompt. It got us right into an administrative console for what we found out to be a remote access device. And we said, that's pretty cool. And in the menu, it had four options that you can choose from, which would be the four devices connected through a serial port to this device. We're like, okay, let's see what this is. Chose the first device, Cisco router. Right into a Cisco router. No creds, no nothing. Just on their DMZ, in their network, through a phone line. When I told them about it, they were like, you did what? <laughs> We've had this assessment for years. Are you kidding me? Like, nope, I, I got right in. I called it. It's like, here are the screenshots. They said, well, can you tell us where it is so we can turn it off? <laughs> the router wasn't fully configured, so there was no IP address, but it did have a host name. I gave them the host name, and they were like, we have absolutely no idea what that is or where it is. But it was one of their host names, because they had a host name convention. It was like the town... You know, the airport abbreviation, one, you know, whatever for the router. I gave them that information. They were able to turn the phone line off, which was good. They were, you know, cut that with the carrier, but they're like, oh, we don't know where the, where that is. We have absolutely no idea where that router is. So, where are your assets? Do you know? Right? What legacy system does your company that's been around for 30, 40, 50, 70 years still have in place? Oh, guess what? Our entire financial system runs off mainframe still. Everyone knows that, right? Yep. Everything is done by mainframe. Batch processing at night with checks. Uh, you want to be sure of your physical assets. Assets. When we're talking about the physical assets, we're talking about property, generally, buildings. What locations do you have? What do they have within those locations? You also want to know about your business processes. This one should be fairly straightforward. What does your business do? Right? How do you do what you do. How do people interact with your business? Those processes are important to understand and look at as a whole to see how someone could abuse them. Like I mentioned, moving millions of dollars through email, they did have some checks and balances both on the inside and the outside, but we found that there was significant gaps in those because they weren't looking at the big picture of what someone could actually do with what they did. And we did execute some of those to prove to them that it was possible to not only forge the documents, saying to move the millions of dollars, but also forge access internally and request access. They had a, a system they used to actually move the money, like they'd open the email, read it, do the information, look it up. But we were able to get access to the system internally when we weren't supposed to. We did have a, you know, email accounts, so we were malicious insiders, but it was still possible just by forging an email internally. So this is what I was alluding to before, where things sort of like overlap, uh, where the electronic, the social, and the physical aspects of your organization. So red teaming is like right in the middle there. Uh, that's what we go after. We look at everything, as long as something is within scope. Uh, sometimes organizations have reasons for taking things out of scope. Physical is probably the biggest one to be taken out of scope the most. 
Uh, they most companies are worried about remote actors, but the physical stuff is fun too. So talking about the electronic, what we're going to go after are the software that your organization uses, your web apps, your thick clients, uh, your operating systems, anything that custom writ internally. We're talking about your network, both your external and internal network, your IP address base, all your infrastructure supporting that, desktops, your wireless networks, your mobile technologies, and also your embedded technologies. I was on another engagement where they did have two-factor auth uh, on their Citrix portal, which was good. But we were able to fish people and get credentials going through. When we were doing our reconnaissance, we discovered their AirWatch server. AirWatch is a, an MDM platform, a mobile device management platform, you know, pushes the email through, all that stuff. When we found that portal, that portal didn't require two-factor auth. So we were able to take our iPhones and register it with the creds that we had onto their mobile device management system. And as long as the device was provisioned, which luckily the user we had did have another device, it would auth you and then start syncing email. So we were able to bypass all their two-factor controls through their mobile device management system and just download all their email. That one was fun. Uh, your embedded technologies. You know, can we get in through your security system that controls your badge? How is that even secure? I was walking into my, we just moved to a new office a couple years ago in New York, and I was just coming back from lunch, and I'm looking up at the, they have a monitor up top that has like the security feeds in the building, so you can see that, uh, you know, you're being watched. Well, one of the screens changed to a administrative page for the security camera system, and the guy was going through and doing an update. So I was like, well, oh, let's, see what happens when he types in password. Because he had to put in your password to sign in. And it wasn't start out, it was just right there. You know, IP address, username, password, everything to upgrade the security system that was monitoring the building. Just, I'm, I'm watching it in the hotel, lo in the lobby. I'm going, are you kidding me? <laughs> like, like, turn the monitor off when you're doing these things, please. Um, we actually had another engagement where the consultant got into the phone system and was able to eavesdrop and listen into calls and conference calls that was going on. What was interesting about that, because the guy's a really good sport about it, he said, well, I wonder how far I could go. There happened to be a conference call going with a bunch of the executives because they were deploying a new data center or thinking about moving data centers, something along those lines. So he jumped onto the line and started listening. And they were talking about all these different aspects and someone brought up security and someone else kind of shot that down and be like, oh no, it's not a good idea. Well, the consultant that was on the line interjected into what was going on and said how important certain things should be and started giving them advice for what they should look for in their new data center client. And they were like, oh yeah, really cool, you know, thanks. And it wasn't until after the call, our POC was in the room too, but after the call, someone turns to him and goes, who, who was that on the line? <laughs> like, who? I want to go talk to them, and they had to tell them that we hacked into their phone system. Uh, but so, your embedded stuff, what other things do you have in your office? You know, we're seeing home automation with Nest and the Google Home and the, e the Amazon Echo, but what does your building have that's supposed to be this, you know, IoT in the cloud thing? How secure is that? Is that on your network too? Probably. Social. This is going to deal with the people. And also some technology, your phone numbers, your social media accounts, you'd be surprised, you probably do it, you'd be surprised what people put on their social media accounts when it's not locked down or set to a private account. Your email address and also your business processes. Phone numbers. Quite easy to discover, a lot of companies have directories online. If they don't have a directory online, they at least have some of their ranges and you can start to piece together where things are. When there was a client on the West Coast, it was nice because I was able to call into them, you know, at 8 o'clock our time, but 5 o'clock their time in the morning and start getting their voicemail greetings. It did scare me when someone answered the phone because I was like, what the hell, it's 5 o'clock in the morning, what are you doing? Um, but 
I was able to get the phone, the names. So when I called back in there in their business hours, I'd be like, oh, hi, Andrea, how are you? This is Tom from IT, right? I knew their name. Because in their voicemail greeting, it had, hi, this is Andrea from so-and-so law firm, please leave your name, number after this beep, you know, what have you. They have their name there. Good way to get people's names. Social media, same client. Um, it was a law firm. There was one of their lawyers was so happy with her new office in San Francisco. She took pictures of her entire desk and wall and put it up on Facebook with client data out on the desk. I mean, could you imagine being opposing counsel and finding that your employees are taking pictures of your case files and just putting it on social media? They fixed their social media policy after that. Uh, email addresses, fairly easy to gather. There's a lot of tools to get email addresses and find out the company's email address scheme. Uh, and also your business processes. Start calling into the phone. Who answers? Is it a machine? Is it a person? Is there uh, an automated attendant you can start to navigate through? How soon do you get to a person? What happens when you call the help desk? Can you find the help desk number? All these things fall into the socials. Again, with the physical, you're looking at your facilities, your access control procedures, and your badge processes. How do you physically get into the building? What does the building look like? How many floors does the building have? What sort of security do you have at that building? That's where we start looking at the physical to make sure all of that is good um, and what could be exploited there. You'd be surprised, I was with a couple clients where they were thoroughly convinced that their RFID cards were the um, high frequency, more secure ones, because they were the thinner MyFair type cards. When I looked at the readers of the building, it was obvious they weren't. The, the readers were low frequency cards and they were cards that could handle both. And the building, even though they were issuing the high frequency card, only supported low frequency, so I was still able to clone their cards and get in whenever I wanted. So now that we went over what red teaming is and the different parts of it, uh, we're going to look talk about building that in-house team, right? You're going to want to do these sorts of things in your organization just to bring your security posture up. And there's three things that I found that make these successful going through. Uh, you want to have an effective team dynamic, right? You got to have the right people to be able to do this work. It takes a specific mindset to make this happen. But once you get those in, you got to have the leaders and the assessors. You got to have managerial support. Without managerial support or executive support, the red team effort will die. This assessment, what we do, ruffles a lot of feathers. It will piss people off. I have been in three hour meetings getting through the report, just telling the client the first paragraph in the executive summary, and they're all just yelling at each other about who's responsible for what. I've also had clients shut down servers in the middle of meetings too. That was fun. Wait, that system, how'd you do that? Oh, I got through this box. That's not supposed to be on. Call Dave right now and get that off. It was like when I called the, the client with the modem that I, it was, he was on the West Coast. So I called him right in the morning. I said, Hey, you know, sorry for waking you up, but, uh, I got into your mode, <laughs> into your network. He was not happy. He was leaving for Thanksgiving, but it is what it is. And you got to have a red, some sort of run book or guide, right? Because having the right people now is great, but they're not always going to be the people that are there. People leave, change roles. You might want to switch up your red team every once in a while, pull people from different departments, maybe have some development and IT folks as part of it as well, just to give a good mix. So you want to have some sort of run book or guide that they can follow so they understand the processes that you're doing, but not necessarily a step-by-step uh, guide for them. You don't want them to go, okay, click A and then B. No, that's not red teaming. It's not scripted. Placing the red team within the organization is also very key. It has to be somewhere on the org chart, right? It has to be. That group, who reports to what? You want the group to be semi-independent. As soon as you start involving too many middle managers about what the team is going to do, stuff is going to be cut out of scope. They're going to say, oh no, my group's not going to be done now. You want to have the support high enough up so that the person says, no, you're being red teamed. 
or doesn't tell them they're being red team and has the authority to do so throughout different business units. You want to be on top of all the business units to make these assessments effective and successful. You also want to be far enough away to remove bias, but close enough that you'll be taken seriously. And that's where the executive level support comes in. You want these reports, you're going to come, you're going to find things. Things that you find uh, that are wrong that could potentially introduce more risk to your organization that you weren't aware of before. You want them to be fixed, right? We don't just want to hack stuff. We actually want them to be fixed. We don't want everyone to be broken into and our credit card information stolen, what, seven times this year over and over again? And again, you want the least uh, possible levels of management between you and whoever the top person is. The most effective ways I've seen this is like right below the CIO or the CISO if there is one. That's who you report to because at that level, as long as the CISO or CIO has, you know, is right underneath the CEO and doesn't have, you know, underneath the COO or something, uh, you'll have the authority to carry out what you're going to do without alerting people, without having to actually tell them you're doing it to make it more of a real world exercise. If they know you're coming, like I said, I mentioned in the beginning of the talk, I've had organizations run their own phishing campaign the day that my assessment starts. Now, we're probably not going to run the phishing campaign the day, the first day, because we're still doing recon. But they do that to get their employees in a more uh, alert state, so they're not going to fall for another phishing email, right? So you don't want to know that they're coming. The team will need some sort of leader. You want this to be a senior member of your organization. You want it to be also someone who has boots on the ground experience. right? You don't want someone just coming in not knowing how to write team works or how to write team. You want someone that has done it before. They will be best to understand and motivate the testers. And you also have to have the business savvy to be able to communicate the risk and the processes and why the red team exists to various levels of management. They will also be responsible for setting goals and providing oversight to the testers and the program to make sure it's successful. The assessors, these are going to be the grunts, the boots on the ground, the people who will be thinking maliciously throughout the process. Now this is, this is fun, right? What does thinking maliciously mean? Basically cheating, right? How can I use X to accomplish Y, even though X isn't meant to do Y. You want to look at a process and go, how can I get around that? Why is that there? You also want people with varied backgrounds. You'd be surprised at how some of the crazy hobbies you have come into play when you start doing red team engagements, right? But you want someone who has, you know, some network background, some sort of development background. They all, they understand how networks and systems are put in place. They understand how software is written, how to read code, uh, support backgrounds, miscellaneous backgrounds. People who are comfortable with lying, cheating, and stealing within the boundary of the rules, right? You don't want anyone doing anything really horrible. But you want someone trustworthy but knows how to lie, cheat, and steal, right? That's... <laughs> Fun little mix there, but we're out there. And they're going to be the ones conducting the engagements. So they're going to be the ones setting up the phishing servers, setting up the attacks, doing the network attacks. So they have to have quite a bit of technical chops. Again, with the managerial support, you need the executive support to be there. And the program needs to be visible with real outcomes that improve the security of the organization. If you come at the end of it and give your report to them and say, okay, hands off, have at it, no one's going to fix it, right? Does your vulnerability management process account for issues that might not have just an IP address? What about business process issues that come up during a red team engagement? It needs to work into, either work into your existing process to patch, fix, update, or be separate and more uh, strategic in mind. A lot of times we come up with quite strategic recommendations for the clients to do because we see gaps in policy. Okay, you don't have a social media guideline or it's very obvious you haven't patched anything in three years, so you should probably start doing patch management on your interior network. Nothing like taking over a 
credit reporting agencies, you know, network within five hours because they ha still have MS0867. Um, but you want to be able to show outcome and goals. Do you have enough support to actually initiate those fixes? Because if no one fixes anything, you, everything you say, no one's going to listen, right? But you want to show that, hey, we're actually fixing these things. And now we went back next quarter, next month, next year, and we were not able to do the same thing we did last year. Oh, and you actually caught us this time, which is good. We have been caught before. It does happen. We eventually find some other ways, but it's good when that happens. That shows over a course of a year an organization actually fixed stuff. To help get that support, you want to be able to set your goals, right? What is this red team going to do? Are we just going to just spray and pray, or are we going to actually focus on what is going to happen? We want to protect certain assets. We want to help protect the company, improve the security posture. And to do that, you want to look for mission statements. Every team group might have a mission statement that says, you know, as the red team, we will work to do X, Y, Z, whatever you come up with. But this will help to keep everything on track to make sure the team is performing the task it's supposed to and so that the leaders and the other executives can better understand what this red team is going to do. Right? What does the red team do? Okay, here's our mission statement. Right? How many times do you have to say it? And you need to be able to explain the risk that the red team will discover. The first part of this presentation was talking about what red teams can discover, what we can find, how we eventually get in what adversaries we're talking about. Start talking about risk. This is getting into more CISSP land, but in businesses understand risk. And they score the risk and try to work out the likelihood of that risk and that threat and how fast they're going to remediate those things. That's how businesses operate. Every organization I've been with, that's how they operate to be able to know how soon they have to fix something. You need to be able to articulate that to them in their terms and say what the impact to the business will be. How will this hurt us? Right? I was on uh, an engagement where we did a lot of application testing for a certain client and we tried to do it as thoroughly as possible and to understand the risk that the applications posed because they were all public facing applications for the client. We asked them the simple question, if you woke up tomorrow and your application was on the front page of the New York Times because you were hacked. What's the worst thing that could be? Right? How does that impact you? And then we'd get out of them what the application does, you know, and how, what would be bad, what could go wrong, what does your application hold that would cause risk to the firm? And that was key for the because they'd be like, well, we went through a pen test already. I'm like, no, you went through a dynamic, you know, you did a tool throw it at you. Now we're going to throw a human at you and see what happens. Find those business flaws that the tools couldn't find. The interesting side of this is that we found very few injection flaws, you know, code level flaws, but we found a ton of privilege escalation. A ton, vertical and horizontal throughout this, because a tool can't test for that. A human tests for that. When you get going, you're going to have a lot of pushbacks. Uh, you know, my users keep falling, will fall for a fishery attack. Okay, well, let's try to fix that and improve it. How is this different from normal testing? We already talked about how this is different from normal testing. Just reiterate that. But these are things that people push back on. Uh, my system network application doesn't do anything sensitive, we wouldn't be a target. Yes, you are a target. If you're on the internet, you're a target. No matter what, you have computing resources, you have something that an attacker would want to go after, you're a target if you're on the internet. If anyone has actually done like a packet capture of an external facing network interface, it's ridiculous what comes through. Absolutely ridiculous. The red team will ruffle feathers. You're going to focus on sensitive parts of the organization. You're going to focus on established policies. You're going to go after people that have been in the company for years. It's going to piss people off. You need to be able to handle that because they're going to, I've been yelled at. You will get yelled at when this stuff happens, when something goes really wrong and you find that one really bad thing that like, hey, the company could fold tomorrow because of this. No one likes that. 
your stakeholders should have enough influence to be able to get through any political threat. People might actually try and stop this program because they don't want their underbellies exposed, but it needs to be. So to be able to communicate that and articulate that is important. The runbook is a guide for the assessor. It's not a step-by-step -step guide. It's not, you know, open the terminal, sudo to bash, type in MSF console, and, you know, set your exploit. No. It's to go over the high level view of how you conduct an assessment. All the phases of the assessment, from beginning to reconnaissance, attack planning, execution, and reporting, it should cover all that. It's going to be a living document. You're going to find new tips and tricks. That's where it should also go in here. You know, hey, we tried this and it didn't work, and we think this is why, so that the next person that goes to do it might not try and do that, or might know how to fix what that problem was. So you want this to be ever-evolving, not set in stone, to help your assessors to complete the tasks. The different phases that we're going to go through, the first one is reconnaissance. This is the information gathering phase, probably the most important step in the engagement is the information gathering. Everything that you find in those first day or so is going to tie together the entire um, assessment. It never really ends. The stuff I find in the beginning is not necessarily the stuff I find in the middle. I have changed course completely mid-engagement because of something I found halfway through an engagement. It's usually broken into two different groups, and it's active or passive. <coughs> passive recon is when you don't touch the organization. You're not poking them yet, you're just seeing what's out there. Getting DNS entries, finding their IP address range, their phone numbers, what their facilities look like on Google Maps, email address har harvesting, without actually touching the organization is what's considered passive recon. Active recon is when you start interacting with the organization. You start doing the port scans, you're going to start to call into their help desk, you're going to start doing vulnerability scans, and you're going to start being on site to see how it looks. Are there guard rotations? Where do the smokers hang out? Where does everyone go for lunch? I was on a, re a physical engagement and the company had two offices literally across the street from each other. And people, staff, were going back and forth to those offices all day. I just stood on the street corner and started taking pictures of badges. I had enough information within 30 minutes to make up a fake badge to get in. Because everyone's wearing the badge over their neck and just walking back and forth between the buildings with stacks of papers, their laptops <laughs> open, walking the streets of LA. But this happens. After you gather your information and learn everything you can about the organization, you're going to start your attack planning. This is where you start to identify how you might be able to go in and start to get things ready. What did you learn? Do they have any meetings coming on? Are they in a building that holds social functions? Who are you going to pretend to be to accomplish your goals? This will help to prepare you for the exploitation phase. And the exploitation phase is when you're actively going to start attacking the organization. This is when you launch your phishing attacks. This is when you're breaking into the environment. This is when you're exploiting any vulnerabilities you find exterior. Now, in the four years I've been doing this, I've only found like two actually exploitable vulnerabilities on an external interface. One was Heartbleed months after Heartbleed came out, which was awesome. But the exterior are generally well protected. I'm not going to say it's going to be protected everywhere, but generally it's well protected. And this could change at any moment. You have to be ready to change based on information that you find or when something doesn't work. Also, phone calling. Try to get password reset. Try to get people's passwords. Physical entry. How are you going to get into the building? Tailgating, RFID cloning, lock picking, covert entry. Post-X is where we've gotten into the environment somehow, and now we're going to proceed to the goal. Something is in mind, get onto X system, or sometimes it's just take over my network, which is fine, and see what is there. Go after the data, maybe try to exfiltrate it. We've had clients set up dummy data in their environment that looks like real data to see if their, um, what's it called? Outbound filtering. The what? DLP, that's, yep. To see if the DLP is actually working because they want to test that, right? We have sensitive bits, will it get out to see if it works? Surprisingly, sometimes it does. You want to have a big bag of tricks. 
the red team is going to have a lot of crazy tools. Some are standard, some are not standard. There are also going to be things that you develop in-house. We have several scripts that we use to do a lot of back-end work for phishing to receive what's going on, to receive the, uh, the creds and what to do with them. We have a lot of templates that get modified every once in a while. You also want to be able to have documentation for these tools, and that documentation should be within that runbook. It's quick how-tos, what it's used for, when you should use it. When you're putting this all together, the red team inside your organization will help improve your security posture. For those of you who do it already, fantastic. You've probably seen improvements if you're conducting such a thorough assessment. You want to have managerial support. You want to put together the proper team dynamic to make this successful. And you want to make sure things are documented so that as people leave or things change or as you rotate staff, that the team can continue to function and still be successful within the organization. Thank you.